Today I'm going to show you the family tree of Swedish monarchs, shown on this chart in blue. I'll be starting with the legendary King Bjorn Ironside, and we'll be going all the way down to the current King of Sweden, Carl XVI Gustav. Please note that I now sell two different versions of my European royal family tree. The original one, which looks like this, focused mostly on Western Europe, so I've now labeled that one with the word West. The new version, which I'll be using in this video, covers Central and Eastern Europe, as well as Scandinavia, so I've labeled it North slash East. Both versions are now available at my website, usefulcharts.com. So the kings of Sweden can supposedly trace their descent all the way back to the Norse god Odin. Of the many legendary kings of Sweden though, the most famous is probably Bjorn Ironside, who is usually seen as being the founder of the house of Munsa, the first royal house. Some legends make him the son of another great Viking king, Ragnar Lodbrok, who was supposedly the ancestor of the kings of Denmark as well. But the first historical king of Sweden is Eric the Victorious. He reigned during the late 900 CE and was a contemporary of Sven Forkbeard over in Denmark. In fact, he is linked to Sven via a legendary woman known as Sigrid the Haughty. Sigrid might actually be a composite of several historical women, but according to legend, she was married to Eric the Victorious first and then second to Sven Forkbeard. This would make the second king of Sweden, King Olaf, the half-brother of Canute the Great, who ruled an empire that included most of England, Norway, and Denmark. Other sources make their mother out to be the daughter of Mieszko I of Poland, which would make her sister to the first king of Poland. But again, everything we know about her is legend. What we do know is that in Sweden, King Olaf was the first king to embrace Christianity, and that he was followed by two of his sons. He also had a daughter named Anna, who is later known as Saint Anna. She married Vladimir the Wise, the Grand Prince of Kiev. So all of the remaining princes of Kievan Rus have a connection to Swedish royalty through her. Which brings me to an important point. Some have questioned the fact that I've included the Scandinavian monarchs on the East chart as opposed to the West chart, because most people think of Scandinavia as being part of Western Europe. Now, although this is true from a modern perspective, for much of medieval history, the Scandinavian royal lines actually intermarried more frequently with Central and Eastern Europe. This is just one example of this, but it demonstrates why I split things the way that I did. Getting back to Sweden, you'll notice that the male line of the House of Munsa died out fairly quickly. In 1060, therefore, the throne passed to a new house, the House of Stienschiel, through a female line. And then after the House of Stienschiel, we actually get two rival houses, the House of Eric and the House of Schwierka, who fought for control of the throne. And I'm not going to go through every king from these early dynasties, but I do want to mention another important point. I've been using the term King of Sweden so far, but I should make it clear that Sweden during the medieval period was not the same size as the Sweden we know today. In fact, through much of this period there were actually two major kingdoms in Sweden, not just one. Sometimes they were unified, sometimes they were not. There was Svealand, land of the Swedes, but also Jotaland, land of the Geats. You might recognize the name Jotaland as being the kingdom from which the legendary hero Beowulf came from. 
Anyways, not until we get to the House of Bielbo that Sweden as we know it today truly emerged as a unified state. By this point, there was a title called Jarl of Sweden, which in English can be translated to Earl or Duke of Sweden. The person who held that title was second only to the king himself, and during the mid-1200s, it was held by this individual here, who married Eric XI's sister. His name was Birja Jarl, and he was perhaps the most influential person when it came to the final consolidation of Sweden. He also founded the city of Stockholm, the current capital of Sweden, and he led the crusade that resulted in Sweden coming to rule Finland for the next 500 years or so. But Birsha Jarl never became king himself. Instead, when Eric XI died, the throne passed to Birsha's son, Valdemar. However, Birsha continued to be the real power behind the throne until his death. After Birsha Jarl's death, there was a conflict between Valdemar and his younger brother, Magnus, in which Magnus ended up seizing the throne. The next generation saw sibling rivalry as well. Magnus III was followed by his eldest son, Birja, but Birja's younger brother, Duke Eric, eventually started a civil war against him. For many years, Duke Eric seemed to have the upper hand, but then in 1317, during a Christmas banquet, King Birja had Eric and another one of his brothers captured and killed. This enraged those who had supported Duke Eric, so they deposed King Birja and killed his only son and heir. This led to Duke Eric's three-year-old son becoming King Magnus IV. Now, Magnus's mother was a Norwegian princess, and it just so happened that in Norway, the ruling Schwere dynasty had run out of male heirs. So young Magnus actually became the king of Norway as well, reigning there as Magnus VII. This was actually the first step in what would eventually lead to all three Scandinavian kingdoms becoming united under a single monarch, something known as the Kalmar Union. But we're not quite there yet. Magnus came of age and was officially crowned in 1336. This occurred during a time when Denmark was actually without a king, having had mortgaged all of its land to German nobles. So that left Magnus the sole king in Scandinavia. But shortly thereafter, King Valdemar IV took over in Denmark and restored the kingdom there. And then in 1355, the Norwegian nobles decided they wanted to put Magnus's son on the throne instead. So once again, we had three separate monarchs for Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Finally, though, in 1364, the Swedish nobles supported a takeover by Magnus's nephew, Albert, and therefore Magnus lost the Swedish throne as well. But here's the other really important link. Magnus's son Hakon, who is now king of Norway, married Margaret, daughter of King Valdemar of Denmark. Therefore, when Valdemar IV died, their five-year-old son became king of Denmark, because Valdemar didn't have any living sons. That boy's name was Olaf II. He was a grandson of Valdemar IV, but also of Magnus IV. When his father Hakon died in 1380, he became the king of Norway as well, thus uniting Denmark and Norway for the first time since Canute the Great. But as so often happens in royal genealogy, the unexpected occurred, and Olaf died at the age of 16. The thrones of both Denmark and Norway therefore passed to his mother, Margaret, although technically she was just a regent. Meanwhile, in Sweden, Albert was growing unpopular, and so certain Swedish nobles invited Margaret to send troops to depose him. This was successful, and Margaret ended up regent of all three countries. The problem, though, was that she had no more children, and in fact, there were no close male relatives that could be named king. So she chose her sister's grandson to be her heir. In 1397, at the age of 16, Eric of Pomerania was crowned king of all three countries in the city of Kalamar, and thus the Kalamar Union was born. 
However, Queen Margaret remained the true power behind the throne until her death in 1412. Eric then had quite a long reign, but since he did not have any children, upon his death, the throne passed to his nephew, Christopher of Bavaria. But then Christopher died unexpectedly before having children. So after him, the Scandinavians had to look really far back in the royal lines to find an heir. The person they found was Christian I from the House of Oldenburg. He was a rather distant descendant of Eric V of Denmark via this female line here. Initially, though, Norway and Sweden chose a different king, a King Karl, from a house not closely connected to any of the ones on this chart. But after King Karl's death, Christian I became king of all three countries and the Kalmar Union continued. The House of Oldenburg is quite important because its male line descendants would go on to reign in Russia as well. In future, they will also include the reigning kings of the United Kingdom, being that Prince Charles, the current Prince of Wales, is a male line descendant of the House of Oldenburg, and thus so is Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, and his eldest son, George. But we're dealing with Sweden here. When Christian's grandson, Christian II, became king, an event occurred known as the Stockholm Bloodbath, in which 82 people were executed, including many Swedish nobles and leaders. This led to a war of independence in which Sweden broke free from the Kalmar Union. The person who led that war was the son of one of the nobles killed in the bloodbath. He was from the House of Vasa and became King Gustav I. And his reign marks the beginning of modern Sweden. He had a long reign and then was followed by his son, Eric XIV. Eric was one of the several royal men who proposed marriage to Queen Elizabeth I of England. She obviously didn't accept, but had she done so, we might have had a United Kingdom of England and Sweden instead of England and Scotland. But it's probably for the best that Elizabeth turned him down, because later in life he is thought to have gone insane. In fact, in a fit of insanity, he murdered five prominent nobles, and therefore his younger brother John took it upon himself to overthrow the king and take the throne for himself. And this is where Sweden almost ended up uniting with another major country, this time Poland. John had married a princess from the Polish-Lithuanian house of Jagiellonian. Together, they had a son named Sigismund, who was elected king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1587. When John III died, Sigismund therefore became king of both Poland and Sweden. But the problem was that Sigismund was Catholic, like his mother and like most of the people in Poland. But Sweden had adopted Protestantism, and Sweden wanted a Protestant king. So there was yet another civil war, and Sigismund's uncle Karl became king. And I should make a quick note here about the numbering. If you've been keeping track, you will have noticed that we haven't actually had 14 Eriks and 8 Karls prior to this point. So it's a bit strange that we get a Karl IX. This is because the kings at the time based their numberings on a list that included several legendary kings that are no longer considered to have been historical kings. But Sweden has decided to keep going with the original numbering anyway. All right, so we now come to Sweden's most famous and most important king, Gustav II Adolf, later known as Gustavus Adolphus the Great. Gustavus Adolphus was a very capable military leader and has even been called the father of modern warfare. He won a decisive battle during the Thirty Years' War that tipped things in favor of the Protestant side, thus greatly impacting the rest of European history. Starting with his reign and continuing for the next 100 years or so, Sweden was considered to be one of the major powers in Europe. And in fact, historians tend to call Sweden during this period the Swedish Empire, even though the Swedish kings never actually held the title of emperor. Unfortunately, though, Gustavus Adolphus died in a subsequent battle during the Thirty Years' War, and his reign was cut short. Having no legitimate sons, the throne therefore passed to his six-year-old daughter, Christina. 
Now, there's been a lot of speculation over the years about Queen Christina due to the fact that she was supposedly raised like a boy, often dressed like a man, and probably had a female lover. All of this centuries before the term butch lesbian was coined. She was also a huge fan of learning and built up a massive collection of books and art. However, at the age of 28, she decided to abdicate and become Catholic. She spent the rest of her life in France and Italy, spending time with several popes and nobles. The throne of Sweden therefore passed to her cousin via a female line. We therefore get a new house in Sweden, the house of Palatinate Svibruken, a junior branch of the house of Wittelsbach. But that house only remained for three generations, after which there were no more males, and therefore the throne passed to Queen Ulrika Eleonora, who then abdicated in favor of her husband, Frederick, a German noble. All of this happened during the Great Northern War, which was the war between Sweden and Peter the Great of Russia, in which Russia won and thus replaced Sweden as the main power in Northeastern Europe. After Frederick I, the throne passed all the way to King Adolf Frederick, who was from the house of Holstein Gottorp, a branch of the Danish house of Oldenburg, which, as I mentioned earlier, had also ruled Sweden during the Kalmar Union. But the reason why he was chosen had more to do with this connection here. You can see that he's a descendant from the House of Vasa through a line involving several females. I should also point out that Adolf Frederick was also very closely related to another famous figure in European history, Catherine the Great. If we follow this line here, you'll see that he had a sister named Joanna, and Joanna is the mother of Catherine the Great. However, Adolf Frederick was also related to Catherine's husband, Emperor Peter III. Through this connection here, that makes them first cousins once removed. So although we tend to think of the remaining Russian emperors as being from the House of Romanov, they were actually members of the House of Holstein Gottorp, and thus members of the Oldenburg dynasty, just like the Danish kings and the future kings of the United Kingdom. But back to Sweden. The house of Holstein Gotorb was actually short-lived there. We get a firstborn son, a grandson, and then a secondborn son who reigned during his old age. And then at this point, there was a succession crisis. Carl XIII had no legitimate living descendants. And in fact, his closest heir at this point would have been the emperor of Russia. So the Swedish royal family turned to adult adoption instead, a rare move when it comes to European royal lines. At first, Carl adopted a Danish prince named Carl August, but Carl August died suddenly and unexpectedly, leading Carl to adopt for a second time. The second adopted son was Jean Bernadot, a veteran officer of the French Revolutionary Wars and one of Napoleon's top generals. But once he became the crown prince of Sweden, he ended up joining the coalition that led to Napoleon's defeat. He also fought and won a war against Norway, which led to Norway leaving its union with Denmark and joining a union with Sweden instead. So when he became king in 1818, he became Carl XIV John of Sweden and Carl III John of Norway. And we get a new royal house, the house of Bernadotte. Carl XIV John was followed by his son Oscar I and then by his grandson King Carl XV and IV. That king's daughter married King Frederick VIII of Denmark and so she is actually the great-grandmother of the current Queen of Denmark. But in Sweden, the throne passed to his brother who became Oscar II. During the reign of Oscar II, Norway achieved its independence and established its own monarchy, choosing the second son of King Frederick VIII and Princess Louisa. In Sweden, Oscar II was followed by King Gustav V, who was king during World Wars I and II, 
he married Victoria of Baden, thus creating the first actual link between the house of Bernadotte and the previous royal houses of Sweden. You can see here that she is a descendant of the house of Holstein Gottorp through these links here. You can also notice that he had a younger brother named Carl, who had a daughter who married the King of Norway and who is the current King of Norway's mother. So lots of connections between the current Scandinavian monarchs. In Sweden, King Gustav V was followed by his son, King Gustav VI Adolf, and he married twice. Before becoming king, he was married to Princess Margaret, who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Together, they had five children, including their eldest son, Gustav, the father of the current king of Sweden. But you can see they also had a daughter named Ingrid, who married the king of Denmark, King Frederick IX. She's the mother of the current queen of Denmark. And so this makes the current queen of Denmark and the current king of Sweden first cousins, which is the closest relationship that exists between two European monarchs today. Prince Gustav died in a plane crash when his grandfather, Gustav V, was still king. So that's why after Gustav VI Adolf, the throne went straight to his grandson, who is the current king, Carl XVI Gustav. Two days from now, on September the 15th, Carl the 16th Gustav will mark 46 years on the throne. That's longer than any other monarch in Swedish history. He's currently 73 and will eventually be succeeded by his eldest daughter, Victoria. Victoria was not originally the heir apparent. She has a younger brother. But in 1980, Sweden became the first European country to adopt absolute primogeniture, meaning that the eldest child inherits regardless of whether they are male or female. Victoria is married to Prince Daniel, and their eldest child, a daughter named Estelle, is currently second in line to the throne. So that was the monarchy of Sweden, all the way from Bjorn Ironside to Princess Estelle. Again, if you want a copy of this brand new poster, the European Royal Family Tree North slash East version, you can head over to my website, usefulcharts.com. If you find history, genealogy, and monarchies interesting, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you check the playlists, you'll find that I have videos covering the family trees of famous dynasties from all over the world. And to see what else I'm up to, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Thanks for watching.